Okay, welcome to this video tutorial on how to use this um, code that we built, the one-shot matrix uh, omnidirectional pressure solver. And uh, here is the uh, MATLAB uh, um, exchange page for it. Um, you actually you can't just go here in the functions because these are just a kind of a sample functions that I built just to kind of um, have you uh, kind of you understand what's going on in a very simple way but here we're gonna dive with a little more uh, realistic data so don't 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 go in don't go through the functions um, click here on the download button and actually download it and then we're gonna get here this upload um, uh, folder we're gonna extract it and then if you see here there's going to be, again, a little written tutorial. Uh, these M files, which are just an example. And this here is the actual compiled uh, file. It's a, a max uh, file that has the function of the same name as the file. So Osmodi would be the call uh, for this function. So if you want to install it, you want to go through uh, to this. Um, you're you're going to copy this file. right? So we're going to copy this file. And we're going to and we're going to go to uh, MATLAB to the MATLAB folder and uh, paste it there, right? So we're gonna paste it there and well, it's already here, so I don't need it. And then you wanna make sure that that, um, that particular path is in your path. So you actually have to go here uh, and you have to uh, make sure that um, that particular folder is uh, within your path. Otherwise you have to add it. But once you've done that, then if you just uh, type here on the, on the screen, you see that it's actually going to call a function, right? So it doesn't say that the function wasn't found. It just says that the function threw an error and it actually gives you a, uh, an idea of what the function should look like, uh, which was, uh, well, it's the prototype of this function. Uh, but we're going to go through uh, how to uh, deal or handle some uh, real uh, data uh, from PIV. This is a, a data set that I captured during my PhD thesis. And if you see here, there's a... Um, there's a bunch of VC7 files from the LaVision, uh, LaVision the Viz, and each one of them is a is a, a vector field from a time-resolved uh, particle image velocimetry uh, that we've done at a fairly low speed. I think the flow velocity was about uh, 2.5 meters per second. Uh, so this is uh, actually a rather slow flow, but it it works as an example. So I'm going to kind of go through the code and, you know, you don't need to, you can read the code as I'm going to go through it, but uh, uh, at least the key points here so you understand what exactly you need to do uh, to process this uh, data. So, of course, the first thing we need to do is to load the data, right? So um, this first section here is just going through the VC7s. So we look at the directory, the current directory, we get all the VC7s. Uh, this is just the delta T we're going to use for taking the derivatives. Um, and then uh, we're going to go through each one of the files. Um, here I'm using PIV mat, which is a nice library to uh, load these uh, VCC7 files. And then um, I'm just uh, pre-sizing pre for the first uh, iteration, I'm pre-sizing the U and the V matrices. Uh, so if you see here the loaded U and V matrices, they have each one has a vector of 384 by 240, and then there's 100 of them, so it becomes a three-dimensional matrix, so x by y by time in this case. And if you see here, dx and dy would be the delta x, delta y for this uh, particular flow field, and then we just populate it. So that's that's very simple, very straightforward, and we get a u and v. This is uh, planar PIV. Uh, there's no w component. Um, it wouldn't actually make any difference if the w component was there. Um, for for this uh, for 2D PIV. Okay, so uh, once we do that, then uh, we're gonna have some um, some data, right? So actually, let's just kind of uh, plot the data. So I'm gonna kind of quickly improvise here a little. So image C of U of column, oops, column column I, and then maybe actually I think I need to transpose it because it's. The way that I set this up, this is x and this is y, and MATLAB uses y comma x, so we have to, or mesh grid instead of ND grid, so we have to just uh, transpose it. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then we just uh, do the aspect 1, 1, 1, and draw now, pause to show the picture, 
and then end. And if we run this little function, uh, you can see it's upside down, but what you can see is the time resolved uh, PIV fields, and you can uh, see that there is a fully separated uh, bluff by wake. Uh, this actually is uh, uh, the wake from a, a slanted after body at a 45 degree angle. Um, so this this is just 100 snapshots, and just uh, for the example, uh, in this case an example purpose, but of course here you, you'll see that this code is reasonably fast. So, okay, so if you look at any of these snapshots, right, so I'm just gonna show one of the snapshots again. Uh, we can see that LaVision populates all of the empty vectors with a zero, and there are some empty vectors inside of the field, right? So this one here, for example, has also a zero, numerical zero, not an approximate zero, right? An actual zero. Um, so this means that this is invalid data. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that the invalid data becomes a NAND so we can treat it separately. Um, and then here I'm gonna make a manually defined mask. So let me actually run this part here. And you see here that uh, now I'm just gonna manually define uh, polygonal region where we know that there is valid data and then uh, wherever we have invalid data there we're going to perform an interpolation uh, which is this uh, fill missing function so I'm going to go through all of the vector fields I'm going to fill the gaps and then apply the mask to eliminate everything that is extrapolation and we're going to go through this it's uh, fairly fast and just so you can see here this is a laptop right so the the CPU here is uh, somewhat powerful. I mean, it's it's a I think it's a yeah 14 cores. Uh, there is a little bit of memory, although we're not going to need it. And there is an, a decent graphics card, but um, this is not like any anything insane. I think uh, we paid maybe two thousand dollars for this computer. So you know, it is a somewhat higher end computer, but it's not anything um, out of the world. So. Yeah, so continuing here. So now that we have this, um, uh, we have all of the fields uh, cleaned up, then we can actually show that movie again, uh, just so you can kind of see how the cleaned up flow field looks like. And you see that it looks about the same. Uh, you can actually see some artifacts on the side here where the interpolation uh, kind of messed up. And this is going to be contaminated data in the uh, pressure solver, but we're going to work with it and see how that um, performs. Okay, so now that we have that, then we can, um, uh, well, the first thing we're going to do here is, okay, so we have a time resolved field, and we're going to do, we're going to assume that this time resolved field could potentially not be time resolved, and the only thing we're interested in is the average pressure. So even if you had, uh, up until now, if you had non-time resolved from like traditional PIV with a lower speed camera at 5 hertz, 10 hertz, uh, you can still do this procedure and get the average pressure. And actually, as we found, it is a very good estimate of pressure uh, from PIV with this uh, type of technique. So uh, what we're going to do here is use the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations. So for that, I'm going to put the, that in, on the screen right now. Uh, but the idea here is that we're going to need uh, the, um, not only the gradients of the mean velocities, but also the, gra the spatial gradients of the Reynolds stresses. So let's first uh, go through the mean velocities because they're more easy to understand. So I'm taking here velocity mean and UV mean. You see here they become just a mean velocity. And then uh, we can actually just uh, U mean, just so you can kind of see. and well, I didn't transpose it, but you can see that this is the mean uh, U velocity. Of course, it's 100 snapshots and it's all time resolved, so it's definitely not the actual mean, but it's a uh, we're gonna we're gonna call it close enough, and this would be the V velocity. Um, okay, so now that to do that, we take the gradients and we also compute uh, this these two lines here compute. Uh, the the um, fluctuations around the mean that we're going to need to compute the Reynolds stresses. So if we actually look at the fluctuations around the mean, and I'm going to plot this one here, uh, you can see that this is a pretty interesting structure on this flow. This is this is the V fluctuations, and if we look at the U fluctuations, 
uh, we see a very similar uh, picture. Just the fluctuations in the velocity may be out of phase with the V velocity as expected. These are vertical types of structures that are coming out of this shear layer here. Okay, so so then, um, yeah, I can actually get rid of this. Doesn't really matter. So once we have the, the fluctuations, then we compute the, the, the Reynolds stresses u prime u prime. Uh, this would be the mean of u prime u prime. Uh, u, mean of u prime v prime and mean of v prime v prime and then we take the gradients of all of them which i'm going to execute right now and you can see that when i'm taking the gradient function i'm using this page transpose function from matlab and the reason i need to do this is because u prime u prime and pretty much everything before right even you mean here you see this uh, is about the same uh, idea but u prime u prime is i think uh, um, or this is kind of a way of doing this uh, for also um, three-dimensional flow fields where you may have more than only two dimensions so if you see here u prime u prime is this matrix where the first dimension is x and the second dimension is y but when you use the gradient function uh, um, in matlab it it assumes that the first uh, the the first dimension is y and the second dimension is x so it's assuming a mesh grid structure which is really annoying but we have to uh, compensate for that so what i'm doing here is a page tra page transpose which is basically like transposing but if this matrix had another extra dimension here let's say 384 by 240 by i don't know a third dimension here z then it would only transpose those first two dimensions and the third dimension would be left alone um, so that's that's just why i'm using this uh, it will make more sense when we look at the three-dimensional demonstration but for here you could probably just transpose of course the results from gradient then also are transposed so then we have to undo the transposing so we recover the x comma y uh, dimension order Okay, so now that we have both the means and the Reynolds stresses, then we can compute the pressure gradients, which is just applying Reynolds averaged uh, Navier-Stokes equation. And the idea here is, well, we define some constant density. This is an incompressible flow, so this is a valid definition. Um, and then we just uh, apply the equation that is on the screen. So I'm gonna execute this. And actually I'm gonna show what uh, dpdx looks like uh, and you can see that there is some there's some stuff blowing up over there so let's actually uh, apply a color map here so c-axis um, let's see I don't know minus one minus one to one times let's say 100 let's see how that looks like there we go so you see we have a lot of gradients and fluctuations on the uh, on the shear layer and it's it's fairly noisy, uh, but we'll see that this actually will be uh, will still uh, work, um, anyways. And if you do uh, dp dy, we we'll do the same thing, and we can see there's a little bit of stuff blowing up. This is not awesome, and it will definitely mess up our boundary conditions. I think if we we should probably make this a little a little more. Um, narrow this window so the the air doesn't contaminate the field too much but this solver is fairly robust to that uh, also if you see here on this region there is some stripes here and this usually is speed clocking from piv um, so you know this is not the most perfect data set but um, that's kind of the idea is to work with an, a real data set with all of these uh, issues that it has so now these two fields, the, depending on how the operations over here and the NANDs propagate through the operations, uh, it may be possible that the NANDs are different for the PDX and the PDY, and that's gonna be a problem, right? So we, we gotta fix that. So here I'm just defining the NAND mask as e if either or um, the PDX or the PDY are NANDs, then uh, we're gonna make anything there NAND. <coughs> So these two lines do that. So now that we're here and we have the pressure gradients and they're decontaminated, then we're golden, right? We can just calculate the pressure right there. And the only thing we need to do is, well, this is the line that actually calculates the pressure. And 
we only need to um, set up the options for the solver. So here I'm setting up, actually I'm going to make it verbose. And you see I have a solver tolerance relative absolute and the device. So the device can be either a CPU, uh, if you don't have, let's say, an NVIDIA GPU, which this code requires, or GPU. Uh, again, this code only works for um, Windows machines. So if you're trying to do this in a Mac or a Linux, uh, that um, Max file won't work for you. And I really apologize. I didn't compile for those machines because I don't have access to machines like that. And I'm not just... I'm just not a big fan of Linux machines. But uh, anyways, so so if you see here, the um, we have here a solver tolerance, right? So this is a conjugate gradient solver, and there's two stopping criteria for it. Uh, you can make this solver tolerance uh, tighter, but then eventually the, the conjugate gradient is going to diverge if it doesn't reach a solution uh, because the condition number may be too high uh, for the, the, for the um, error on, on the on the iterations of the conjugate gradient. So don't make this too tight. I mean, this this is definitely good enough um, where one in this case would be uh, the initial error in this um, in the solution of the uh, equation. Okay, so, so now that we do this, so I'm gonna run these lines and you see here that I defined delta, right? So delta would be both delta x and delta y. Uh, and you have to provide both at the same time as a little matrix here. So if you see in our um, in our Osmodi uh, function, we have two outputs. So we have the pressure as the output, and this CGS um, line here uh, comprises of just the convergence uh, as a function of iteration. And as inputs, we have to provide dpdx, dpdy, and dpdz, even if the field is 2D, as this as this, in this case it is. So, and they have to be of the same size. So the only thing I'm doing here, the dpdz will not be used if the solution is 2D. So, or, yeah, if the fields are 2D. So then you just provide it and make sure that it's matching the same dimensions as the other fields but you don't need to provide anything meaningful here. It could be even like some random matrix. So what I'm doing here is I'm using ones size of the PDY to copy the size of the PDY, but have just ones. Um, you can also see that all of these are defined as singles. And the reason for that is because uh, it's just easier and there's no real penalty as far as we looked at. Uh, there's no real penalty in defining this as doubles or singles, but you can fit more singles in a GPU memory. So I prefer to do that. But unfortunately, you can't do that um, a posteriori. So you have to do it here. Uh, so that's why I'm uh, actually probably can do it, but I just uh, couldn't be bothered. So just just type single of something here and it will work. Um, we also have to provide the, the delta x, delta y, or and if you have delta z, you have to add another element here for delta z. And then these options will populate uh, the options for the conjugate gradient solver. Okay, so now that I explained everything, um, I'm going to run this uh, these lines here. And you can see here that the time it took for it to execute was 0.67 seconds. Uh, this is a somewhat large field, so it's about 100,000 elements. And you, we can see that it converged uh, successfully, you know, fairly quickly. And it kind of gives you an idea of how the convergence looks like. And if these residuals are growing, then you, you had a diverse solution. Uh, and that can be for many uh, reasons, but usually it's because your domain either ha has too many holes or too many uh, nouns in the middle of the domain. Um, but usually, if you have a reasonable domain and it's somewhat consolidated, uh, this this will work um, just fine. So yeah, so now we have a result for PMIN and CGS. So let me show you CGS first. So CGS, you see, is a 709 uh, by three um, result, right? And the first the first column is the iteration number. The second column is the relative residual, and the third column is the absolute uh, residual. So if we just plot here. And this is a typical convergence plot. So in the x-axis, we have the iteration. In the y-axis, we have uh, the convergence. And you see we start uh, with, well, the zeroth iteration is one. So the first iteration is already improved. And then as it keeps going, it keeps improving. And then uh, when it reaches your stopping criterion, which in this case was 10 to the minus 4, then it returns. OK, so 
this result, this mean pressure is unreferenced, right? So there is no real reference. And it's interesting that you don't need to provide the reference prior to defining the solver. But after that, you probably want to define a place where you have a reference location. So the way I'm doing this here is I'm defining a place x infinity, y infinity, right? So let me just kind of uh, image a C of P mean mean transposed. And this is the result, right? Uh, here, the, the pressure is already um, with respect to the P infinity. But one thing you can see is that X infinity is 365 and Y infinity is 233 is about here, right? So 365, 223 is about here. And this region here I chose as the reference because it's the, cl it's the closest location in this field that is about the free stream. I didn't want it to put it right at the corner. You know, it's just not a good idea. Uh, although it probably wouldn't have been a problem in this case. Okay, so... And then, of course, that region ha there has the free stream velocity. So I pick up the free stream velocity and then I define a free stream uh, dynamic pressure. And then I use that uh, to shift all the values. So once we do that, then we can define a mean CP by dividing by the free stream dynamic pressure. And then here would be the result for this um, average uh, CP uh, for these uh, 100 snapshots. And you can see that it, it makes sense. Uh, this is a fully separated bubble. So we have um, this flow actually accelerates in this region here. And then in this region, we have a fully separated zone. And here we recover to the free stream uh, dynamic pressure of CP equals one. So it's a typical bluff body wake uh, type of um, uh, result. And this would be the average pressure. That's the only thing that we got here. So I'm going to save this uh, result uh, um, as a mean CP. You see, I already had one here, but I'm going to save it again, uh, overwrite it. And now we're going to do the same process, but we're going to do a time resolved version of this. OK, so I loaded the instantaneous pressure uh, demonstration and it's a very similar code. So the first thing we need to do is to load the VC7 files, uh, which I've done. Now there are in memory. Everything else is cleared up. Uh, we're going to do the, the gap filling. That's exactly the same as previously. And then uh, we're going to compute the derivatives. But now, uh, in contrast with the previous code, I'm actually going to pull out the, the previous code here. So in the previous code, we had to compute the, the means, and then we had to compute the Reynolds stresses, and then take the derivatives of the Reynolds stresses. Now uh, we're working with time resolved data. It's exactly the same data, but now we're, we're actually work, we're using the leveraging the time resolved uh, part of it. So um, I'm going to compute the derivatives for this um, with the same gradient function, but now also using the time as a derivative. So we have also du dt and dv dt. So I'm going to run this. And then now we have the derivatives. I'm also going to compute the, the um, second derivatives so we can compute the viscous term, uh, although it doesn't really matter for this particular fields. But um, it may matter for you if you have, let's say, a more viscous fluid, um, like uh, even water probably is already sufficient. So in this case, it's about 100 times less. I, I actually, I should probably show that. So let's, let's, um, uh, and then of course we compute, uh, uh, we just use the time resolved number Stokes equations to compute. So this would be the material derivative, and this is the viscous term. Uh, and actually, let's um, let's call this here um, viscous x, right? So let's so mu du d, d squared u dx squared plus d squared u uh, dy squared, and then this part here we're gonna call dp dx. Oh, I didn't do the row, so let's do row. Okay. Oh, I didn't put the semicolon there. But um, so now let's let's compare, right? So image c of dp dx. Well, let's transpose it. And then let's put a color axis here from minus 100 to 100. Oh yeah, and uh, now it's a 3D field. So we have to, let's look at just the first uh, snapshot. Uh, and then we're gonna create a new figure and we're gonna do the same thing for visc sub X. And there we go. So they're both in the same uh, color scale. And you can see that the the convective term which is the left uh, graph here is far larger than the viscous uh, contribution which is on the order of 
maybe 10 or so. Uh, so actually, if we just uh, change the color axis here from minus 100 to 100 to minus 10 to 10, we can see that it is, that's the order of magnitude for um, the viscous contribution. And this one seems to be of the order of uh, 1000 even. Let's see. Yeah, you see 700, 800, 1000. So, so they're so far apart that it doesn't matter. But here I just wanted to compute both just to be sure. So I'm going to run it as I wrote here. And then we're going to do the thing where we make sure that the NANDs are matching. And we're going to run our Osmodi again. Uh, but the only difference is now we have we're running one by one so i'm just going to run here and you can see it takes about a half a second or so for each one of the cases so i'm going to fast forward here to the last case and there we go and you see here it took about 42 seconds to run all of these 100 images so that's pretty nice um, and you know the code is somewhat efficient i think this is pretty good uh, and it's good enough for pretty much all data processing these are 2d fields right in 3d uh, it's way more efficient as, as I, I find and this is all documented in our paper okay so now that we have all these pressures let's see how it looks like and you know let's see if the uh, the time resolved pressure uh, looks about right so i'm going to play a movie here and one thing we can see is that the time resolved pressure, it seems to be fluctuating pretty wildly in this region here. And this is something that uh, we observed as we were doing this, that there is no enforcement in the, in the time resol resolved part of this. Um, th there is no communication across time. So this means that there may be some, um, some uh, gradient here that may kind of uh, slant up and down, up and down. And it could uh, it could create this uh, kind of a wild fluctuations in pressure. Surprisingly, though, if we take the mean pressure, so I'm going to run here this code and take the mean, the average pressure of all of the uh, pressures that we took uh, before. Let me actually make sure it's in the same color scale. Yeah, so 0 0.5 to 1. And I'm going to save this one as mean CP time resolved. And I'm going to open here the original mean CP and you can see that they are fairly fairly close they're not exactly the same which is very interesting but let me actually fix this okay now they're they're all square domains and I'm alternating between the, the two and you can see that they are fairly close so the average pressures are correctly found but the Inter the instantaneous pressure seems to fluctuate quite a bit and we are not quite sure we've we've played this uh, with this for several data sets other researchers also see this um, and we don't purport to uh, have solved this part of the problem uh, but um, our solver at least uh, it works for uh, finding um, well either instantaneous or solving this uh, Navier-Stokes equations and there seems to be some uh, um, drift or deviation uh, that comes uh, when you have maybe a compounding error on one direction or another. So we discussed 2D planar PIV, both time resolved and averaged. And now we're going to be looking into 3D PIV. So I'm going to load this data set that we built uh, from a scanning stereoscopic PIV on a double fin. And there's, there's a lot going on in this data set and I don't need to discuss everything. But the the idea here is that we we performed scanning PIV, we got about a thousand planes, and then we performed averaging to get a hundred um, averaged planes. Each plane has about 30 averages. Well, the first thing we need to do here is to um, define our U and V velocities based on this data. So I'm going to run these lines. And then here is the part that is interesting. So uh, Van Oyd Heisden uh, in 2008, he, he outlined all of this. This is not my idea, but here I'm going to kind of uh, show the, the discussion. So we have here a Mach 2 flow, and these are the conditions for stagnation that we measured. Uh, we have sensors in our stagnation chamber and all of that. And what we're going to do is we're going to compute our temperature field just from velocity. So we get our Mach infinity, um, which is defined as 2 in this case, from the nozzle uh, geometry. And then we're going to define um, our, our temperature as a function of the um, magnitude of the velocity 
as measured by PID. So we do this, and then we get a temperature field. So I'm going to show you a slice of this temperature field. Yeah, there we go. And this would be, so this is the, a slice of the temperature field in Kelvin. And you can see here that we have um, very low temperature at the free stream, the fully expanded flow, and then we go through an oblique shock, and then another oblique shock, and we get to a somewhat higher temperature. And then uh, there is an expansion fan in this region. This, this is where the fin would be. There will be a fin here and there will be a fin here. And then eventually it goes down. Um, and we, we don't have any more data, right? <laughs> um, okay, so this process here is going to be exactly the same. We're going to compute the means, the fluctuations, take the derivatives. Uh, the only difference is now we have to take the derivatives of the temperature. And yeah, so I actually pulled out the paper here just so you can kind of see. So these equations, again, from uh, this paper, Van Oet Huysden, uh, 2008. And you see here that we can get uh, the static temperature um, at any point by just uh, using an uh, adiabatic flow uh, assumption, which is a fairly good assumption for this. So once we do this, then uh, we have this conservative form of the compressible Rand's momentum equation. Uh, and you see here that we need the temperature gradients in the x, y, and z direction. So imagine like you for these are actually three equations. So if you run the index i from 1, 2, 3, that, that's equation 1, 2, 3. So for equation 1, i equals 1, you get dt x1, which would be x, and then dt dy, and then dt dz. And then you have here um, the average of uh, the fluctuations u, 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 v, and u, w, and you get all of these cross terms, and then you get this, which is the actually important part, right? So this here is the same as a pressure gradient, but instead of the pressure gradient, is the gradient of the log of the pressure. So if we go back here to our code, so we get all of these uh, temperature gradients and fluctuation gradients. I'm going to compute all of those, and then once we do that, then you see here that our source terms, so the pressure gradients, uh, I'm calling dp dx, but it's actually d ln of p dx. And we have uh, one for each one of the derivatives. So um, this equation here implements the equation shown in the paper. And there's all of the terms here uh, we have to expand. And if you're interested, um, you can just pause here. Let me pull out. I'm going to run this part of the code, and then uh, here I'm going to show how the, the PDX looks like for a slice. And the reason why this line is in the code is because you see here that the slice, uh, the PIV actually is a little corrupted in this region, so we probably want to get rid of this region just to make sure. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a Roy Poly and do that masking procedure, so I'm going to do that right now. And I'm going to get rid of this whole region here. So I'm going to draw a polygon and then I'm going to kind of expand it and here I'm selecting a polygon to delete. So create the mask and then if now I show the image again you see that it's cleaned up. Uh, a note actually about this data set is and you're going to see this uh, after we compute the pressure. Uh, if you see here there is this crap here. Uh, in this region, which is upstream of the shock. So the flow is uh, from left to right. It's kind of upside down. Uh, the floor is here. This is away from the fin. There, this is where the first shock is, and this is where the first expansion is. And you see here, there's some crap here. So this crap is a dead pixel in our camera uh, that we couldn't, uh, well, there wasn't much that we, it's actually a bunch of dead pixels. So all of that correlated to a zero velocity, and then create a bunch of gradients there. So it's kind of annoying. We couldn't clean up that effectively given the amount of images we had to process. So we just uh, we just lived with it and we don't look at it. we don't look too closely at that region. Okay, so um, and this is how a cross section on the other direction looks like. This again, this would be the source terms, and you can see you can also see there's some asymmetry. So it's pretty symmetric, but if you actually see this region here is a little more stronger than this region. Um, and there is some asymmetry in the actual values, uh, but that will turn out not to be of any uh, concern. 
So now that we have the gradients of the log of the pressure, we can do the same thing. So we can just run our Osmodi and uh, just so you can kind of have a sense, right? So the size numel of the PDX is 5 million elements, right? So 5.7 million elements. It's a massive um, array. So let's see how long it takes to run. There we go, 2.3 seconds. Super easy, right? Um, and of course, if you've never seen the other pressure solvers, you may not appreciate this, but this is a pretty efficient solver. Anyway, so if we see here, um, we have here then um, this this here, this line would be to use a reference point. So this particular position I selected is at the free stream. Um, and then we get our mean log p. But of course, to get the p on p infinity, again, um, what we calculated is this, right? ln of p over p, p mean over p infinity. So we need to exponentiate that to get the actual p on p infinity. So we're going to do that. And then now we have our result. This is this is it, right? And the, that's, I mean, there is a little bit of setup, a little bit of data processing, but now we have our uh, p on p infinity. Let me see if I can show you in the memory. So there we go. So it's 212 by 266 by 101. And I'm going to show two animations taking slices on two directions. So this would be uh, slices on the stream wise would be x and y would be span wise. And we're looking, uh, we're moving uh, in the um, away from the ground direction. And you can see as the slices move up, uh, we can see the shock waves kind of moving. You see the crap that I was talking about. There's a bunch of crap here. And we just don't look there. Um, and the, re the pressure reconstruction, uh, we actually saw that it matches somewhat well uh, with the with the surface pressure uh, that we measured. So we are um, fairly confident that this is an, uh, an uh, okay estimate of the pressure field. And again, first seen uh, in this particular flow field. Okay, so, and that's where the data kind of ends. So that would be slices in this direction. And then uh, here's just another animation showing the slices uh, in the other direction. So the, uh, here would be the ground plane and then X is the streamwise direction and Y is the wall normal direction. And we're taking, we're slicing away from the fin. And uh, now we're getting towards the center and you can actually see the lambda shocks uh, showing uh, here as a pressure jump, which is exactly what a shock is. So that's pretty cool. And and that's where the the tip of the fins is. And this is pretty much where the data ends. So that's pretty cool. And I would end the video here, but I actually, uh, I think it's also worthwhile mentioning that we can also get the other fields, right? So temperature, pressure, and density from PIV, right? So we get all the four fields. So we already calculated pressure. This is pressure. Uh, of course, the actual pressure is P, uh, is P on P infinity times P infinity. I think I have P infinity here. Yeah, P infinity, which is in Pascal. So this is the actual pressure field. So now that we have the pressure field and we have the temperature field, then we can go and just use the ideal gas law. So uh, P, P equals rho RT, so rho equals P over R times T. So this means that I can make the same animation. So this is our temperature in Kelvin and you can see the jump in temperature across the shocks. can also see here the there is a feature in this middle which is a slip line that happens because of the two crossing shots which is again unseen before and I think this would be the density so you can see so these are volumetric measurements of density right in a compressible flow which is really cool and I think there is a lot that it can uh, be used to compare with uh, computations right so so we're looking forward to seeing this being explored by other researchers and hopefully this uh, is interesting. So 
uh, well drop us a like if you find this video useful and you can see our link to the code uh, both the matlab exchange and whenever the github is released the open source version of this code so i hope you have a great day and thank you for watching